Welcome to our services today at the Father's House. What a delight it is to have you here with us to uh, look into the Word of God and to gain encouragement and direction for our lives, especially during this troublesome time that we have here, not only in the United States, but, but around the world with the pandemic that's taking place, and how there are even churches that after months are still being told not to hold services and, and uh, threatenings of prison and fines. Who would have ever thought in the United States? Uh, it's also um, election time here within the next couple of weeks. We'll be uh, having our election for president. And, it, and it's been said in the last election that somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of, of Christians didn't vote in the last election. And how important it is for as if we want to continue to have our religious uh, freedoms and, and our constitutional right to gather and to assemble, and, and not only for us, but for our kids and for our grandkids and, and generations to come, to get out and vote and get out and vote according to the word of God. There is never going to be a perfect candidate, and, and we know that, and so we just get as close as we can, and we push towards that mark that the Lord is calling us to. A couple of weeks ago, we took a few minutes and we talked about um, examining ourselves and how important it is for a self-examination. Now, this self-examination, once again, is not to to beat us down and to discourage us, but rather it's to to show us where we are falling short of of, um, God's standards and His direction for our lives. And as we uh, grow closer to Him, His presence grows stronger. He continues to give us the grace to obey. So, this morning, if we were to take the time to look in 1 Corinthians, it's a scripture that we, that we often use for, for communion, and it's found in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five 25 through 31. And it talks about this self-examination. And it says, After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This is the cup in the New Testament in my blood, this do ye, as oft as ye drink of it, in remembrance of me. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. See here in verse 28, let a man examine himself. It's good for us to be honest with ourselves and allow the Spirit of God that uh, ability to light up the areas that need work. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged." And so once again, we need to be honest with ourselves, even as we take a look at the Word of God and to see where there are adjustments that need to be made in our lives. This same theme of of self-examination goes even back to Exodus. If we were to take a look at, at the tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness, there was a laver there and it was filled with water and and in that a bowl, for lack of a better explanation, there was a mirror in the bottom. And, and that mirror would allow the reflection of the priest as he would go there to um, see where he was defiled, to see where it was that, that he needed some cleansing to take place and to take out of that water and to apply it to those areas that needed a washing. And so we could go into many more details on that, but, but, but you can see what I'm getting at as far as the self-examination. We do a song around here. It's called, Change Me, Lord, Change Me, Lord, Don't Let Me Stay the Same. Lord, I want to be just like you. Take my life, make my life just what you want me to be. Lord, please change me. Change me, dear Lord. And we all have areas in our lives that that need change. We all have areas in our lives 
that need that water to be, the, the water of the word to be applied to it so that it cleanses us. In our message today, it tells us in Hebrews 6, 1, leaving therefore the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. This particular verse in Hebrews is, is telling us that once we have that foundation laid, we need to um, move on in our walk with the Lord. Uh, Paul talks about the, the Corinthian church being able to give them milk of the word, but, but that meat was available. And so it's, it's our responsibility to continue to grow and to desire um, more of the meat of the word of God and to go on into perfection. That particular verse goes on in 6.1 and it says, not laying again the foundation. So today I want us to just take a few minutes and, and to look to make sure that, that we have the foundation. Um, as, as many of you know, I'm, I've built houses and, and so the foundation is, is paramount in the building and the construction of, of any building. Now the foundation is that which something is built on whether it's big or small. The bigger the, the bigger the building, the bigger the foundation needs to be. And so we need to recognize that, that God is wanting us to have our foundation upon the rock, which is Jesus. Jesus spoke of a wise man that built his house upon a rock in Matthew uh, chapter 7. Would you take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 7? I hope you have your Bible with you. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. There are so many apps that are available on tablets and on phones to be able to have access to the Word of God. So as we read here, I hope you're looking at the Word of God and not Facebook. <clears throat> Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now that, that verse right there ought to um, g get our attention pretty quickly, recognizing that it's not those that say, Lord, Lord, that uh, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. In Matthew, once again, in verse 22, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out devils in thy name? Have we not done many works? In, in this particular verse, it tells us that, that it's probably not the mainline denominational churches that he's speaking to because most of them are not prophesying in his name. Most of them are not casting out devils in his name. Most of them are not doing many wonderful works. So, so it should be especially to, uh, to uh, alarm those of us that walk and are trying to walk in the fullness of what God has according to the word. And then he goes on in verse 23, will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon the rock. So we see here that, that the, the one that builds his house upon the rock is the one that is doing the will of his father. Continuing on in verse 25, and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not because it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, the flood came, the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall thereof. So as it pertains to a self-examination, we want to make sure that we are walking according to God's will so that we might be able to um, have built our house upon this foundational rock, which is Christ Jesus. Now, in some cases, when we build things, we have to go down to bedrock. And so we put a foundation upon a foundation. We, we, we build upon that which is sturdy so that when the wind and the rain blows and comes, that the disasters that take place won't affect it. So this morning we want to take a look at, at a foundational precept. 
one that um, perhaps we've not looked at for a while, but, but one that uh, makes sure that we are standing upon the solid rock, Christ Jesus. This foundational precept is actually found in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7, and it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart with all thy soul, with all thy might. Jesus actually quotes this in Matthew 22, verses 35 through 40. There was a lawyer that came to Jesus, uh, perhaps you remember it, and, and he said unto Jesus, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Let's pray. Father, today is by your mercy and your grace that we come to you asking, Lord, that you open our hearts, you open our ears and our eyes that we might see and that we might hear and that we might perceive what it is that you're speaking to us today. May we not leave here the same way that we came in, Change us into your image, in Jesus' name. Foundations. It's, it's, it's said in sports, and, and I'm not a big sports fan, as many of you know, but it's said in sports that fundamentals win championships. It's, it's too often that teams beat themselves because they have forgotten or, or they aren't uh, uh, polished up on the foundational fundamentals that, that are required for them to succeed. Uh, coach Wooden, who was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's uh, coach, uh, the, the story is told that the very first day that uh, Kareem went to, um, uh, to practice, that Coach Wooden... Um, sat the whole team on the floor and he told them, take off, take off your shoes. And then um, it, the story goes on to say that Kareem was like, I don't want to take off my shoes. But he goes on a step further. The coach does and says, take off your socks. And, and so how he said, I am not taking my socks. off. I just, I don't, you know, feet can be kind of humbling sometimes. And so Finally, if he, he decided, if I'm going to be a part of the team, I'm going to have to do what I'm told, and so he takes his socks off. And the coach goes on to show them how to put on their socks correctly, their shoes correctly, so that they don't get blisters, and so that it doesn't impede their ability to play the game that's, that, the, that they're um, uh, learning for. And so it's important to recognize that, that even the basic fundamentals, putting on your shoes and your socks in, in sports, was deemed to be worth um, uh, telling these players and, and giving them direction. It also is said that Vince Lombardi, um, when he would get his players at the beginning of the season, he would set them down and, and he would take a football in front of them and, and he would start at the very basics and say, this is a football. Now, that seems to, it would go on without saying, but to be able to um, emphasize the foundations of that which we are trying to be a part of and learn is, is, um, uh, is so important for us each and every time. So today, we want to remember, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all of thy might. And, and so as we read those words, we, we have to ask ourselves, have we come um, uh, up with a new definition of all? Have we somehow convinced ourselves that more than others is enough? 
Have, so there are, there are a few questions that we want to ask ourselves this morning. So is, is just being better than someone else, uh, is, is that all? That is, is that all um, with all of our heart, our mind, our soul? Comparing ourselves with ourselves, the scripture says well, we become fools. Have we been distracted in our Christian walk by the things of this world or by Satan to where we haven't given him our all? We, we've only given him um, that which is oftentimes left over. Another question that we need to, to answer within our own hearts and minds is, do we as the church of Jesus Christ look or behave much different than unsaved good people? Now there is a question that, that resonates within my spirit. Do, do, do we as a believer do, do we act different than, than um, good people of this world? People that are bound for hell, but, but yet are good and decent people? 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When, when we got saved, did old things pass away? Did, did everything become new? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, something that had never existed before. Old things have passed away. And and if we were to take uh, the time to look at that sentence structure, we would see that things have passed away and are passing away. It's it's a day-by-day process. It's it's a walk with the Lord that um, those things pass away and behold, all things are become new and are becoming new. As we grow in him, as we learn the, the word of God and, and what is expected of us and, and, and how are we are to walk uprightly before him. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 says, Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, not touching the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Now that's not to say that we're supposed to separate ourselves from, from the people of this world because how will they hear if no one is telling them about the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ? We are to separate ourselves from the things of this world, not the people. In 1 John two fifteen and 16, The Apostle John tells us, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Notice the things that he lists here that are of the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, I've got to have it the pride of life, look at me, look, I am something else, is not of the Father, but is of the world. 1 Peter 2.9 goes on to say, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We've been called out of darkness, the world, into his marvelous light. Has there been an ongoing change in our lives and in our conduct after we received Christ as Savior and Lord to the degree of light and darkness? Especially for those of us that have been um, walking with the Lord for 30 and 40 years, has, has there uh, come such, such a separation between lightness and darkness that, that the world can see that there is a difference? Or as I asked earlier, do we as the church of Jesus look and behave any different than those that are of the world that are good people? The Apostle Peter, you remember Peter. In 1 Peter 1.15, he says, But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And that's conversation is not just our, our words, but it is our conduct of life. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Be ye holy as I am holy. Separated. Walking uprightly. 
oftentimes we as, we as Christians have the same entertainments of the world. We go to the same places. We go to the same movies. We go to the same restaurants. We listen to the same music. Uh, we go to the same concerts, the radio, the, mu- the websites. We watch the same TV programs. How, how is there uh, uh, to be a noticeable difference in our lives if we are continually being fed the things of this world? Be ye separate and come out from among them, the scripture says. If the spirit of the living God dwells inside of us, and he does, he will guide us into all truth. The question is, will we cooperate? This process is called sanctification, and it is an ongoing daily crucifixion of our fleshly desires toward the things of this world. Sanctification. The daily crucifixion of those earthly desires that would so easily, Paul tells us, that so, the sin that does so easily beset us, that we put them to death. We put them to death in our lives. Because of the Spirit's indwelling, we have had a change of heart. And we are becoming into who and what we are called to be, and not only to be, but as to do as Christians. When we love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our might, it will affect our behavior. It will affect our behavior because we are different. We are a new creation that we spoke about here a minute ago. Revelation uh, 2 and 3 Uh, It tells us seven times in those two books, he that hath an ear, let him hear. Notice that that the the book was written to the church. He's he's, he's telling us that, that those that have ears, let them hear what the Spirit is saying. And we could take the time to go over and and look at the the parable of, of the virgins, the five foolish and the five wise, and we would see in that that uh, not only was the, the lack of oil an issue, <clears throat> but we would see that um, further down in that passage, it says that they all slumbered and slept. Are, are, are we slumbering and sleeping as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in this, in this end time when people need to hear the gospel more than ever? Are, are, are we asleep? Are, are we K Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be? Um, have we become so complacent uh, that, that we allow the, the world to run our nation uh, that was built upon the foundation of, of uh, the scriptures and, and of God? Have we become, someone has said, for evil to prosper, all that needs to happen is good men to do nothing. And so how important it is for us, even in these last days, to be a part of the solution. So the, so the question begs asking, how do we keep ourselves separate from the world? Because the world is so bombarding uh, us to such a great degree, how, how do we separate ourselves from, from such great influences? That separation comes from one word. Grace. It is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that will keep you. Grace, we know, is, has been defined as um, uh, God's unmerited favor. But I would challenge you to go and, and look into your Bible dictionary. But it also is, it goes further than that. And it talks about God's divine enablement. His divine enablement to allow us to keep his commandments. It is his spirit that is within us that strengthens us, that, that, that says, um, don't do that, or this isn't the way to, to, to walk. Go, go in a, and, and we all have weaknesses, and, and the thing is, we know what our weaknesses are and how we should avoid those. We should build um, walls that would separate us from any of those kinds of things so that we might continue to g- gain strength and to walk as the Lord desires for us. So once again, how do we keep ourselves separated? If you'll remember in the Old Testament, um, Aaron and his sons were set apart for the ministry unto the Lord. Set apart for the ministry 
unto the Lord. And we too are set apart. Sanctification. We're set apart for, for the things of God. But it tells us in Exodus 29, um, in verse 1 and verses 19 and 20, uh, write these down or if you can turn to them. It says in verse 1, And this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them uh, to hollow them, to minister to me in the priest's office. Take one young bullock and two rams without blemish. So notice here, he gives direction on how that that separation is to be taking place for them to be able to minister unto him. Excuse me, in verse 19, it goes on to say, and thou shalt take the other ram and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the ram. Then thou shalt kill the ram and take of his blood take of his blood and put it upon <clears throat> the tip of the right ear of Aaron and upon the tip of the right ear of his sons and upon the thumb of their right hand, upon the great toe of their right foot and to sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. Here we see uh, in the Old Testament the process of setting apart of Aaron and his sons to minister unto the Lord and to do the work of of the ministry. And, and so how was that done? We saw here that they, they took the blood of, of the ram and applied it. Do, I, I'm not sure you got that. The, the blood was applied. I'm so glad the blood was applied to my life. And I pray that the blood was applied to your life so that we too have been part of that generation that is, or, or that remnant that is called um, born again. Born again. Those were the terms that Jesus used. The blood was applied. I am so glad the blood was applied. The blood was applied to the, to the doorposts of the angels would pass by. You remember that um, when the uh, children of Israel were to come out of Egypt, they were to kill a lamb and the blood was to be applied to the doorposts. And then when the death angel went through the, the, the places where the blood had been applied, the death angel would pass over. Has the blood been applied to your life? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, we sing. The blood that Jesus shed for me, we sing. The blood was applied. The blood was applied. Whenever the Bible speaks about the ear, we, we just saw here that the blood was applied to the ear. It's in reference to our ability to hear. Matthew 13, 13, Jesus spoke in parables so that the hearing would not hear. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and without faith, it's impossible to please God. Matthew 10, 27, what ye hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. James goes so far as to say, be swift to hear and slow to speak. That which we take in through the ear, we think about. It comes in the ear. We think about it. We think about it long enough, and it turns into actions. So we need to be, as the uh, Aaron and his sons, the blood applied to the ear, to be careful what it is that we allow to come into uh, our beings through the ear gate because the blood was applied. Next we see in that passage that the blood was applied to the thumb. Whenever the blood, or whenever the Bible speaks about the, the thumb, it's in reference to what we do. It's, it's part of our hands. Can you imagine um, functioning uh, properly with, without a thumb? Jesus told us in, in Luke 9.62, no man having put his hand to the plow looks back as fit for the kingdom of God. Colossians 3.23, and I know there are a lot of scriptures here, but write them down and you can, you can look them up. Whosoever, uh, uh, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. The things that we apply ourselves, do it as you're doing it unto God. Whether you're um, cooking supper, you're cooking supper for Jesus, whether you're building a house or whether you're, whatever it is that you're doing, do all that you do unto the Lord. And we're reminded in Matthew 5.8, that Jesus put forth his hand and touched people. 
the blood was applied to the thumb. That which we think about affects what we do. What we do, our thumb is instrumental, our, our, our hands. The next place that the blood was applied was the toe. Whenever the Bible speaks about the toe, it's in reference to our walk, where we go. And, and, and we know that, that the, the big toe, it, it, it not only helps us to get where we're walking to, but it also gives us balance. Do you have balance in your life? Do you allow the New Testament and the Old Testament to combine together to give the whole counsel of God that we might walk in a balanced walk with Him? The toe is in reference to our walk. In Psalm 119, verse 105, the word, uh, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The path that we are on should be growing ever brighter and brighter towards the Lord. We should be more in love with Jesus today than we were last month or the last year or 20 years ago. First John tells us in First John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ's son cleanses us from our sins. The blood is applied. Walk in the light. Walk in the light. That which we do with our thumbs, with our hands, that which is taken in with our ears affects where we go and what we do. So we see here that the blood was applied for the separating of them for the work of the priesthood. Now you say, Pastor Tom, that's, that's all fine and dandy, but what does that have to do with us? I am so glad you asked. In 1 Peter, we looked at this uh, uh, passage a few minutes ago, but it says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are a priest of the most high God. It doesn't matter whether you have credentials behind your name. As we walk in the light, we are children of light. And it is for us, Jesus said, go into the world and preach the gospel. And he didn't say that just to preachers and pastors and, and, and to priests, but, but to all the world. Go and share the gospel. And, and, uh, and through that sharing, that uh, many would be saved. So what does that have to do with us? We are a priesthood, a holy nation. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Have we come out from among them? Perhaps we did at one time and we found ourselves uh, sliding back into uh, the ways of the world. The scripture tells us, come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord, touch not the unclean thing. We sing a song around here. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth Will grow strangely dim In the light of his glory and grace And the things of earth Will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Are the things of this world growing dimmer to you? I've noticed as, as I've grown older that, um, and, and perhaps it's because his return is so near, that, that the path that we are on is becoming ever narrower and narrower. The, the light that is on that path. There, there, there are things that, that per, perhaps they're not seeing, but you just don't have time for them anymore. Now is the time to draw near unto the Lord. Today is the day of salvation, the scripture says. 
come out from among them. Turn your eyes upon Jesus because in Matthew it says, Matthew 5, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherein shall it be salted? Notice here that the salt at one point hadn't lost its savor. It did affect. We know that salt is a, is a preservative. Um, be salt. It goes on in verse 14 in that same passage. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set upon a hill cannot be hid. So we are to be salt and light in this world that we are living in. He's called you out of darkness. He's brought you into his marvelous light. And as that light shines upon you and in you and through you, people will see, people will notice. So in closing today, I would encourage us to be ye holy, even as he is holy, the scripture said, and be ye separate, come out from among them. How do we be holy? I'm not here this morning to give you a list of uh, what I think you need to do and not do to be holy before God. Um, that, that's legalism. When, when I put my convictions upon you, that's, that's legalism. But we each have the spirit of the living God in us. We have his spirit in his presence and he will guide us if we will allow it. What I am saying unto us this morning is that we are to be different and to become more like Christ every single day. Different than we were. Once again, comparing ourselves with ourselves, we become fools. But if we love the Lord our God with all of our heart and all of our mind and all of our strength and all of our spirit, then, then when we get to that place where all is actually all, then we don't have time, as I said, for those things of this world. Our convictions and our conscience must not be squelched by the world. We have rubbed up against such ungodliness for such a long period of time that we have become hardened into uh, what truly is um, uh, against God and what truly offends Him. Remember that friendship with the world is enmity with God. 1 Kings 19.12, the scripture talks about a still small voice. There were many miraculous things that were taking place in that particular uh, passage with Elijah, but it was a still small voice. Uh, are, are we still able to hear the, the voice of the Spirit when, when there are so many voices in this world that compete for our attention? Are we still able to hear it says, this is the way, walk ye in it. Being led, those that are led by the Spirit of God or the sons of God, the Scripture tells us. Now, I'm also uh, when I when I'm talking about um, being holy and being separate, I'm not talking about behavior management, looking good on the outside for others to see, yet inside refusing uh, refusing uh, 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 to allow us to change. Jesus dealt with that with the scribes and the Pharisees in Matthew 23. He accused them of being whitewashed sepulchers. They looked good on the outside, but the inside was filthy, full of dead man's bones. Now also, let me be clear that in this be ye holy, be ye separate, and, and, and allowing the Spirit to guide us and to direct us and, and how it's not a behavior management, but it's that grace that comes to us to allow us to uh, become more like the Lord Jesus Christ, that, um, uh, th that there's nothing that we can do. Our, our conduct does not, um, our, our salvation does not depend upon that, that degree of conduct. We, it, it's a free gift, the, the gospel, for, for by grace are you saved through faith, but not of yourselves. It is a gift of God 
for each and every one of us. But as we have that gift of God and that spirit dwells within us, we'll not want to walk like the, the, the world does. We'll not want to uh, walk like the things that, that so uh, uh, offend our God. And, and Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandment. And so we do have, once again, that self-examination. Are we keeping his commandments? Do we love him? There's nothing that we can do to earn our salvation, but James also tells us in James 2.17 that faith without works is dead. So we need to be, um, our conduct needs to be aligning itself with the new man that is within us, that new creation. Once again, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If we could um, gain our, our access to heaven by the things that we do, how would we know how much it takes? How, how would we know when we finally have, had arrived to the degree that, that we are um, finally made it to heaven? Now, my list of convictions may be different from your list, but if we will all give, but we will all give an account unto God um, for the deeds that we have done, and not only that, the deeds that we have not done. Second Peter one three, it tells us that his divine power, his divine power, you remember that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. He shall quicken your mortal body. He'll make it alive. Once again, the scripture does, not, uh, scripture does give us directions on how to live a godly life, and they are very clear. His divine power hath given unto us all, uh, given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Let me read that again. His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. The knowledge of him. How do we get, gain knowledge of him? It's through his word. Through his word. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. You want to know what the works of the flesh are? It says, now the works of the flesh are these. Take a look at those. Are these. Proverbs 6, 16 tells us that these six things the Lord hates. So we, we, we even gain further direction. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6 that all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. You know, some things just aren't good for us. Romans eight fourteen. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Our desire is to be led by the Spirit of God that indwells us to give us direction. It says, this is the way, walk ye in it. Don't go there, don't do that. And then when we do sin, that we rush to him. If we, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We do not have to allow that to continue to build and, and to uh, continue to uh, separate us from, from uh, the, the clear communication that we can have through the Spirit. Today, we want to leave this place challenged, not condemned. Chastisement comes from God, but condemnation comes from Satan, and we need to be able to discern the difference. Once again, the Satan's desire is to steal, kill, and to destroy. God said, those whom I love, I chastise. Romans 2.4, it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. It's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. There seems to be such a negative connotation about repentance. And that's why it is so important for us to have altar, whether, whether it's in a church, whether it's in a home, but, but a place that we can kneel before the Lord and, and we can confess our sins before him. 
an altar. There is a calling of the Spirit of God in these last days to draw near. Let me say that again. There is a calling of the Spirit of God in these last days to draw near, come higher, and set aside the things that so easily distract us. The Spirit's calling is to rise above the mediocrity and to deny uh, selfish pleasures which hinder our relationship with God. The time is short, and only true diligence and cooperation with the Spirit's leading will cause us to fulfill the purposes and the plans that God has for our lives. Have you filled His plans and purposes for your life to the very end, to the greatest degree that is possible, or or is there still room for improvement? Today, as we've taken this time and this self-examination, I realize that it's, it's not a shouting message. It's not a feel-good message. But it is the Spirit of God telling us to come near. Be ye holy. Be ye separate. Come out from among them. Let that blood be applied to the ear, to the thumb, and to the toe, to, to be separated, to be called from uh, darkness into light, that we might be light and salt. Today, the Spirit is speaking to all of us. It has spoken for us um, different things that, that we individually need changed in our lives. For some, perhaps, that are listening um, through media, that's a, a step of salvation. Saying, Pastor Tom, I, I don't know for sure that I'm saved. The scripture says you can know these things for sure that you have eternal life. And so we need to be able to press in till we get that assurance that we know that these things are written. Faith. Faith is merely believing what God said that he would do and that he will do it. For some, the next step might be a step of renewal of commitment. Perhaps for you today, you have um, slipped, slide. The scripture uses the term backslidden to some degree, some perhaps a little, some perhaps a, a great deal. But the next step for some will be the renewal of a commitment, a commitment that you had made to the Lord. And not only a commitment, but a commitment through your actions. For some, it may be the step of drawing near unto him. Drawing near. Make an altar right where you're at, in your chair. But please, I beg of you this morning, please respond to the Spirit's calling. If the Spirit has spoken to you to surrender your life, do so. If the Spirit is calling you to a renewed commitment, do so. If the Spirit is calling you to draw near, please do so. Don't be so quick to get up from His presence today. Sit, listen to the sound of His voice. We know so many voices in the world. We know uh, the voice of those that we are well acquainted with. Would to God we would be so well acquainted with him that his voice would be one that we recognize. Take a few minutes today. Surrender unto him. Give him your all. Time is short. Hell is hot. And eternity is too long. Let's pray. Father, in your word in Psalm 139, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me into the way everlasting. Lord, give us the grace that we need to fulfill your purposes and plans for our life. Lord, let your spotlight illuminate those areas in our, in our beings that we have closed the door to and said, Lord, you can't go there. Help us to open those doors. Allow you to cleanse them. And as David said, 
One thing have I desired, Lord, that I may dwell in your house forever, and I shall be satisfied when I awake with your likeness. And everyone said, Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Don't put it off today, friends. Turn toward the Lord with all of your being. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. God bless.